Uh, hi, everyone. It's a really pleasure to be on the stage with you today. My name is Xiao Wei, and I'm a software engineer on the ML Infra team at Airbnb. Uh, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to share with you our journey with Ray and how we evolve ML platform at Airbnb with the Ray Air ecosystem. So to many of us today, we're aware that Ray Air stands for Ray AI Runtime. But when I first introduced you to my colleagues at Airbnb, there was this moment of confusion, like they thought it's in-house development libraries, because our trend of naming uh, internal services with the keyword Air. Like uh, the workflow engine is called Airflow, the service mesh system is called Air Mesh. Uh, so naturally, the name Ray Air seemed to be a perfect fit to our ecosystem. And later on, uh, it proved that the integration of Ray Air into, ecosystem, into our ecosystem was a seamless process. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's get into today's agenda uh, we have. To start off, I will introduce existing ML infrastructure at Airbnb with a side-by-side -side comparison between cloud-native solution built on Kubernetes versus Ray for ML developments. Here, we aim to offer a comparison that will highlight the benefits of each approach and provide the foundation for the next section. Next, I will delve into our learnings on how we integrate the Ray in terms of user-facing API and system efficiency. In the end of this section, we will review the benchmark results we achieved for our LM offline training together. This will provide a clear picture of our current standing and the progress we've made so far. Uh, lastly, we will close our session with a forward-looking discussion and a sneak peek into our future plans. Now let's get started with our first topic, ML Infra at Airbnb. Before we jump into the uh, infra tech stack, I'd like to take a step back and see how we adopt machine learning in general. And in fact, ML plays a crucial role in the end-to-end -end user customer workflow on the platform. Uh, let's take a journey through this process, starting from the home page and the search box. Search ranking model bridges together guests with the curated list of Airbnb stays. When the guests browse through the list, smart pricing model behind the scenes suggests most competitive prices for each listing. Following that, uh, once the guests have completed their booking on the platform, trust and safety model ensures that accounts and the sensitive financial information are kept securely in safety hands. Additionally, NLP and nowadays the LM assistive tools help the customer support agent in solving extra requests efficiently if needed. Now having understood the role of machine learning, uh, let's move on to discuss the tech stack. To support the diverse range of use cases, Infra team at Airbnb offer a comprehensive set of in-house developed libraries and, so and APIs that build on top of open source software. Uh, to name a few, the offline TensorFlow distributed training adopts Harvard and the Kubeflow that allows us to train over tens of, tens of terabytes data sets efficiently. Once the model is trained and ready for online use, model owner could choose from a wide range of serving backends, like NVIDIA Trident Inference Server or TensorFlow Serving. Other open source software examples, including Jupyter Notebooks and Airflow, that are used by prototypes and production workflow, respectively. And majority of the ML applications are running on top of Kubernetes, with the exception of Spark-based data ETL pipelines. And in a nutshell, ML Infra is Kubernetes-centric. And building on what we just discussed, let's take a closer look at the Kubernetes application runtime. From this diagram, uh, you can see that ML applications are fully encapsulated as native Kubernetes resource. This kind of setup makes managing and scaling our application much easier. Uh, let me break it down for you. So the leftmost blue box uh, is the lo user local develop prototype environments on Jupyter Notebooks. And it is deployed as a single Kubernetes pod with a remote developer access. Next, ML Online Serving is fully managed as a Kubernetes deployment that supports rolling upgrades, horizontal pod auto scaling, and service discovery. Uh, moving on to the ML Offline Computation, these are fully wrapped as a Kubernetes job for run to complete ML tasks, like model training or model evaluation, et cetera. And in the case of distributed training, Kubeflow training operator orchestrates a fleet of worker pods uh, for data parallelism-based training workloads. Uh, so, as you can see, we've got a pretty neat setup here with Kubernetes that does make our infrastructure management easier. Uh, on the other side, 
Despite the fact that the Kubernetes is a powerful and versatile platform, there are various feature gaps that we've encountered in the past, and we roughly categorize those into three buckets. The first bucket is around the Kubernetes operational support. For example, uh, we have issues regarding the default scheduler's ability to support the fractional GPUs, or exposing runtime container metrics and the telemetries for end users. The second bucket contains issues around the usability and the developer efficiency. ML application written from local environments requires extra infra overheads that are invasive to user code base to be able to submit for remote execution. And uh, we will review one example in the next slide. Last but not least, the recent emerging needs for LM development has brought with it a new set of infrastructure challenge. Uh, these are primarily related to scalability, hardware efficiency, and the need to support more latest ML frameworks. Uh, for, for context, prior to 2023, ML community at Airbnb are heavily invested in TensorFlow, uh, whereas nowadays for open source LMs, these are dominated by PyTorch. Additionally, the advances in LM libraries such as PyTorch FSDP, Hugging Face Accelerate, and Deep Speed are not yet well integrated into the existing training orchestration layer built on Kubeflow training operators. Well, uh, this sum up the feature gaps for cloud native based solution. Uh, in the coming slides, I will provide a few more examples and share our learnings from Ray. Uh, let's dive in. One common operational support issue we've encountered with Kubernetes, uh, particularly uh, when we are troubleshooting and debugging tasks that are run out of memory, or called like OOMD. So you may have noticed that Kubernetes have this very rigid memory management like studios, so, which means that as soon as the job is running over the memory limit, the main container and the job itself got terminated almost instantly. So it's kind of like flipping a switch. And the downside of this is that the pod logs and T metrics oftentimes are not properly forwarded to another system. And to make this even more challenging, our job telemetry are scattered across different like, systems and components. Like logs are saved in Tibana and metrics are in Datadog. And uh, those are not directly linked to the Kubernetes runtime, execution runtimes. Uh, for example, the uh, in the case of missing critical container logs, we have to rely on the runtime usage matrix. Uh, that's the one on top that has this about a container that has memory liturgy to keep restarting itself. And the, the matrix on the bottom is the actual memory like, uh, limit at uh, 40 gigabytes. So understanding these two metrics, we can tell and debug what happened exactly at the runtime. So in the next chapter, uh, I will demonstrate how we're tackling this challenge with the help of Ray. Uh, for the Ray runtime control, the auto memory prevention support offers active memory usage monitoring and a direct intervention. So as a result, infra is still intact while the user application crashes. And we could achieve a clean separation between the user code base and the underlying infrastructure. In this case, that's the Ray cluster itself. To make the debugging process uh, even easier, the Ray dashboard allows end user to have a task level debugging support like detailed logs, metrics, and the profiler, all living in one central application. So Kubernetes operational support is not only feature gap. Uh, now let's move on to the, another issue around uh, usability and the developer efficiency. Here is a quick, one quick example. The yellow box is a user local developer environment, and the blue box on the right side is a Kubernetes remote runtime. As you can see, Model training functions defined locally uh, will be invoked at runtime with an infrastructure driver logic that load the training function modules, uh, runtime dependencies, and manage the function input output on, on behalf of the application owner. As a result, it's hard to fully reproduce the remote failures locally. And in the case of distributed training, uh, it would take significant longer time to replicate a horrible runtime locally. And at the same time, mixing user code with the infrastructure API also made, means there will be extra overheads during infrastructure migration, like system upgrades or security patches. Alternatively, remote execution with Ray can be similarly scaled from local to remote. Here's an example. During the prototype phase, Ray application can be executed locally with the hot Ray cluster created by the Ray init function. 
And the same array app can then be submitted to a remote cluster with a different scaling config, like number of GPUs or number of workers. In the meanwhile, dynamic runtime control or dynamic runtime environment allows users to fully customize and control the remote execution entry point and the dependencies. This further guarantees that the local and the remote runtime are consistent. In conclusion, RE provides a robust solution that not only supports fast iterations, but also ensures seamless scaling. Uh, now let's review the last feature that we mentioned earlier around the Kubernetes centric ML infra. As we briefly mentioned, physics, physical limits, or in general, during ML developments is often referred to as the GPU memory wall challenge. Uh, the general rule of thumb here is that each model parameter is going to consume at least 18 bytes at the training time. So that roughly translates one billion model as 18 gigabytes of VRAM requirement without considering other overheads like uh, GPU memory fragmentation, et cetera. And however, the typical commercial available GPUs like A100 or the latest H100 generation only offer up to 80 gigabytes of memory. To make this even more challenging, as the blog post from 2018 uh, from OpenAI illustrated in this diagram, the y-axis indicated required GPU computation power is growing about five to six times faster than the underlying GPU hardware capacity. And this diagram ends in 2018, actually. Nowadays, with the state-of-art LMs, uh, the, those models are actually developing even faster at the order of magnitudes higher than the GPU capacity. So as you can see, there is always this contention between model size and hardware limits. To truly democratize the LM developments, a number of uh, innovative measures have been introduced by the community. Uh, for example, a deep speed zero redundancy optimizer and PyTorch FSDP. So those methods worked by fully shared the model, optimizer status, gradients, and the parameters across multiple workers. So as a result, it's possible to fully to scale your model capacity linearly with the number of GPUs. And there are other optimization solutions like CPU offloading and uh, activation chart pointing that treats the computation power for less memory consumption. And in theory, thanks to the combined solution of those te techniques, LMs that way beyond the single GPU limit can now be trained and fine-tuned on cheaper GPU clusters. And uh, in next slide, uh, we will delve into how these solutions can be practically applied with the Ray Air Trainer. Uh, in fact, it's very straightforward to enable this, these changes. So in the diagram on the left side, there are three major code updates, including a much simplified resource uh, configuration in staging uh, config, and then a rear trainer that wraps the existing PyTorch training loops. And the third change is the customized deep speed configuration. As a result, ML community at Airbnb got immediate access to vast majority of open source lab LMs from hugging phase, and the training can be deployed to less expensive GPUs like A10G. And uh, here's a quick test we had uh, offline. Um, so one single host containing eight A10G GPU is possible to fine tune model up to 12 billion parameters with a reasonable speed. And uh, fine tuning model up to 60 billion param is also possible if we further scale the number of GPU from eight to 32 A10Gs. Uh, now we just finished the brief intro of ML platform and how Ray Air solved a lot of the feature gaps between Kubernetes and ML applications. Uh, next, let's move forward and take a closer look at our integration journey with Ray Air. Here is a high-level overview on how we set up Ray-based MLs on top of a public cloud provider. There are three primary design goals we outlined. First of all, developing with the Ray Air API should be easy. If you check the diagram on the left side, the user ML app logic is developed with the Ray Air library entirely. There's no more invasive ML infra drivers or libraries so that ML engineers or data scientists can take advantage of, of any recent progress and upgrades made available by the open source community. And the layer below the user app is a full set of infra API that submits a read job to remote ephemeral clusters so that end user don't need to worry about how the infra setup works. The second goal here is to ensure cost efficiency, as we are aware that is at this point that model training, especially for LMs, are extremely expensive. 
and achieving cost efficiency is mission critical. Uh, we will deep dive into the details of achieving full elastic recluster uh, in the next few slides. And the, the third focus here uh, is LM training efficiency. That is to achieve high GPU utilization rate. And uh, I'm gonna share a few more hardware customization in the end of this section. So let's now go uh, deeper into these goals and how we achieve them on the rate-based ML infrastructure setup. Uh, to start off, there are a few common user dev scenarios. Uh, so starting from local prototypes, an ML model owner could easily provision on-demand rate cluster locally to test out the code changes, library upgrades, and the different rate versions. And once the result is validated, ML applications can be scaled out and submitted to a remote execution engine that provision ephemeral rate cluster on-demand. So this could be single run to complete rate app or a full-fledged ML workflow. We will review both cases later. After the remote job is run successfully, model owner could check in the read job code and have code reviewed, which later become part of ML production workflow that is scheduled to run on the fixed cadence. So this flow from local prototype to remote execution and finally to production forms the backbone of ML app development process. And let's proceed to next section where we'll deep dive into the uh, specific API designs. Here's a quick overview of the direct redrop API. The first diagram on the left side shows the user app logic that's implemented with Ray Air. So this can be any like public access tutorials from Ray documentation site. And the, the second diagram on the right shows the job submission process that the package the user code onto a persistent storage remotely and then request to provision Ray class on demand with the given hardware resources. So in this case, it's requesting 10 workers with uh, A100 GPUs. And uh, that's the highlight of the uh, job API. Now let's take a look at the workflow API, which connect multiple different jobs. And uh, to work with, with the re application in end-to-end -end ML workflow, we extended our workflow DSL support to integrate the re application as a workflow building blocks. Uh, in this example, a decorated Python function is defined as a part of workflow DAG. And the re steps contains, uh, first of all, a cluster spec for ephemeral re cluster similar to the re job API. And secondly, a re application defined in the Python function body. And uh, in this way, the re based ML workflow achieves both, uh, for one, mixing up with the non re based steps, like data fetching from external data warehouse using Presto or Hive. Uh, secondly, the workflow ensures that the data persistence, so after the ephemeral cluster is decommissioned, that is when we tear down the real object store, critical data sets and the trained models are stored properly. Now with the, the easy user access API, let's, we need to pay extra attention on the overall cost. This slide we mostly focus on the cost efficiency factor and the primary goal here is to achieve a fully elastic rate cluster built on top of AWS. There are three major components uh, in our custom managed Kubernetes cluster, including the EC2 auto scaling group, or ESG, and the Kubernetes cluster auto scaler, and the Kubernetes. Here's the sequence of events during the rate cluster scaling up. Once the job is accepted by rate cluster, it triggers the auto scaler sidecar to modify custom resource definition of the cluster with additional replicas in worker group. And then one additional Kubernetes pod will be provisioned by a Kubernetes operator during reconciliation process. And following the unschedulable pod events, Kubernetes cluster auto scaler invoked the ASG API to add the new EC2 compute node at the Kubernetes meanings. Uh, in the end, a new worker pod will be scheduled and then join the re cluster as a worker. Uh, likewise, the cluster scaling down followed the similar event sequence, but uh, the other way around. To sum up, the synergy of these components ensures that our cluster are in fault scale mode. So this setup minimized the resource fragmentation across rate clusters and then enhanced the cost efficiency factor. Now that we have offered a easy user access to a cost efficient rate cluster, our next step is to ensure the efficiency of each individual rate job. 
An important factor to consider uh, when we discuss training efficiency is the hardware accelerations and the underlying network setups. Uh, as we all know that the data parallel based distributed training requires consistent network communication to sync the gradients at any which steps. And by adopting deep seed stage three based optimization, there will be another 50% overheads on the overall network throughput. So enabling high throughput communication channel across the workers are essential to LM trainings. And to achieve this goal, we've adopted the AWS Elastic Fabric Adapter that supports OS bypassing GPU direct RDMA across physical hosts. Uh, for example, the P4 nodes come with the four-way 100 gigabits per second channel. And most importantly, those improvements are fully transparent to the real cluster setup. And it's compatible with the common ML frameworks uh, like NVIDIA and Nikol. In our offline benchmark with the, the Llama V1 model, enabling the four-way EFA achieves about six to eight times speed up. And having said that, let's examine the final achieved GPU utilization rate uh, with the one of the benchmark model here. So in this table, we train the GPT Neo X 20 billion model with a rate on deep speed stage three. And by using limited number of GPUs like 16 or 32, it's possible to achieve around 150 T flops per A100 GPU. And in comparison, uh, as the blog post uh, Transformer Math 101 outlined from Eleuther AI, their achieved T flops number is around 180. And this also aligns with other industry standard solutions like uh, Metatron Deep Speed. Here, one quick note is that the GPU kernel fusion optimization uh, strategies like flash attention can also work with the Ray Trainer seamlessly. Uh, before we proceed, uh, let's recap what we've achieved during the rear integration by using the LM developments as an example. Uh, firstly, Retrain and its wide range of ML framework support like FSDP and DeepSpeed made it possible to train and fine-tune LMs on inexpensive GPUs. Secondly, by introducing easy user access APIs, then RE can be seamlessly integrated into our production ML life cycles. And uh, in the third, Kubray can play well with the cloud native auto scaling strategy so that we can create a full elastic RE cluster that minimizes idle resources and the cluster fragmentation. Uh, last but not least, both hardware and software optimization like RDMA and the flash attention can enhance ray train runtime transparently. So this concludes the, our integration story uh, in this section, but this is just the beginning and there are more exciting projects ongoing. Uh, to start off, we're investigating 3D model parallelism so this primarily target model beyond 30 billion level and involve pipeline parallelism for internode workers coupled with tensor parallelism for internode workers. And uh, at the same time, we're also assessing the integration of ray server using aviary. So this is another interesting area that we believe it could potentially save the LM's online serving cost uh, by features like continuous batching. Lastly, uh, we plan to consolidate different training engines like the Kubeflow training operator and the Kativ so that we can minimize the operational support burden on the infra team. Uh, so as you can see, we have a very exciting journey ahead of us. Uh, and the one thing I've learned throughout the integration process with Ray and LMC is that the open source community is developing so fast. Like the foundation LM models and uh, the online serving techniques and fine tuning strategies are oftentimes shifting on a daily basis. So I'm very excited about what's ahead of us and looking forward to engaging more in the open source community. Thank you, Xiaowei. Wei. Um, we can have a couple of questions. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh, this is Chong Xiao from Uber. So I have a, a few questions related to the model parallel part because uh, we're also working on that part. First, you mentioned that with deep speed stage three and uh, uh, activation checkpoint and other fancy stuff, it is possible to scale number of tunable parameters linearly. So my question is, in your real case, did you see the linear, linear scaling happening or actually you see it's below the linear scaling? What's your, what's your lesson learned? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. 
So in our offline test, we're actually very limited by the number of GPUs at this point. And uh, so with the model up to 13 billion parameters, we are able to run those distributed training tests with the like, number of P4 up to four to eight. So that would give us a number of GPUs to 30 plus. But we don't get a chance to further like, experiment with a more number of GPUs. Hi, uh, thanks for the speech. My question is about RDMA. So the first one, are you using it at Airbnb? And if you do, what kind of use cases are using it for? Uh, so in our case, it's mostly for distributed training. Like uh, if the like all reduced communication is based on Nico, for example, those can take advantage of RDMA directly. Does that answer the question? Uh, it's actually at the one layer like below Ray. So Ray Trainer help us schedule all these like parallel workers in that sense, right? But the Ray Trainer is not opinionated about how the communication channel are created across those workers. And uh, for example, Ray doesn't solve the all reduced communication like, like issues, right? So that's uh, all handled by one layer below uh, by the NVIDIA Nico library. Okay, uh, thanks for the talk. This is Anand from Uber. Uh, I was wondering, have you done any benchmarks between deep speed and FSDP? Like, I uh, think I've tried both, but there's no like, ob like observable difference between these two, at least from our offline benchmarks. Hi, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I was curious for the cost optimization of using of GPUs and stuff. Is it just the ephemeral clusters which are leading to cost optimizations? Or are you doing anything on top also to kind of conserve cost and conserve GPU usage, et cetera? Uh, so yeah, for the job facing API, we have a resource manager. So that's just like one layer of like guardrail before any job got scheduled or any re cluster got provisioned. And uh, across different teams and different organizations, we have a different level of like resource management. So that, that's like one factor. And the other one is, uh, yeah, we basically rely on the auto-scaling feature of the cluster. So we don't have idle resources. All right, another round of applause for Xiaowei. Thank you so much. Thank you.